National investigative correspondent Michael Isikoff sat down with Trump and questioned him about his business dealings. We'll talk to Isikoff in just a few moments about his great interview that finally forced Trump to address the truth about his real record in business. The questions went to the heart of the very thing that Trump claims makes him a credible candidate, his business success. You've clearly had some big successes in the business world, but you've also had some big failures. And let's go straight. Well, I don't think I've had big failures. Uh, Donald Trump has always been very, very successful. And so when you say failures, I don't think I've had failures, but let's go ahead, ask me about a couple. Okay, Trump hotels and casinos filed right. for bankruptcy protection three times in six years. Okay, let me explain it to you, very simple. Isn't that a I, failure? Not really. I mean, look, it worked out very well for me. It was very successful. I then levered the company. I took it public. So I had a, a relatively small piece of the company. And what happened is Philadelphia... Wait a second. You were chairman of the board. Excuse me. You were chairman of the board. Uh, I was chairman, but I didn't run the company. I had nothing to do with running the company. Management ran You were paid $2 million a year. Excuse me. I didn't run the company. I'm just telling you. So what were you paid $2 million some. a year for? Excuse me because of my genius, okay? <laughs> excuse me, excuse me, genius. He had three bankruptcy filings in six years for a Trump hotel and casinos. Genius? But that's just the beginning. Trump's habit of slapping his name on other people's products has also landed him in court. There are also some ongoing lawsuits in which investors in Trump projects are suing you. Um, claiming they were deceived. They thought they were buying into a Trump project uh, and discovered it was only a licensing deal. Trump Tower, Tampa. You were down there for the ground groundbreaking. You said this was going to be a spectacular project that was going to redefine Tampa's, uh, Tampa's skyline. In fact, you weren't an, an investor in the project at all, and it's never been built. It was just a licensing deal. I was not the developer of those sites. I licensed the name Trump to those buildings. In case you haven't heard, there was a market collapse. And these people did better than most other people in Florida because they got some of their money back, and they may get more of it back. They're still suing you. Oh, yeah, I think it's working out very nicely. I think it's working out. I'm not sure the investors would agree. That's why they're in court. But it does look like these deals do work out for one guy at the end, Donald Trump. Now, he has a theory as to why that is. Do you think it's fair to say that sometimes you exaggerate? I don't think I exaggerate any more than anybody else. I think that I have a great grasp of numbers. I have a great grasp of values. I'm worth many, many billions of dollars. You may very well be impressed, even you, with all your negative questions about very small things. Even one of your friends said that your real genius is that is for self-promotion. You're a modern-day P.T. Barnum. Well, I think my real genius is not actually in promotion. I think I build great product, great locations. Everybody says, oh, gee, what a great salesman he is. It's this. It's not my salesmanship. It's what? This, you know what that is? It's the brain power. What do you think is stronger, Trump's brain power or Charlie Sheen's tiger blood? I wish Isikoff had asked him that. All right, well, actually, let's bring in NBC's national investigative correspondent, Michael Isikoff. Michael, you asked him plenty of other things. It seemed a right. bit Sorry contentious. I hadn't thought of that one, uh, <laughs> you know, but I will next time. Um, right. So now, he said at the end there, you with your negative questions about right. small things. How contentious was this? You know, he got pretty prickly, as you can see from that interview, and I, I don't think he uh, appreciated being challenged on um, on some of uh, his spin on some of what have clearly been business failures. But, you know, bizarrely, the thing he got most exercised about is uh, what his uh, net worth is. I cited Forbes magazine estimate of, uh, of $2.4 billion to him, and uh, he corrected me. He said, no, no, Forbes has more recently in its international edition right. up it to 2.7 and of course he claims it's about seven billion dollars we won't really know for sure unless he a declares for right. president and then fills that that fills out that financial disclosure michael form. michael we actually uh, we have that piece of the video i love it so i want to make sure that everybody sees it let's run that sure how much are you worth a lot of money and you may very well see that number in about 
70 days or 80 days. Forbes said 2.7 billion. Okay. And 2.7 is very low. It's much lower than the actual number that I may be showing to people and to the rest of the world right. in a couple of months. If I run, shortly thereafter, I will send a statement of financial and cash and how much debt and all that, and I think people are going to be very impressed. It's actually much bigger than any numbers I've seen. Other than being generally unbearable, bragging about his wealth, uh, you know, it's a little hard to believe him, and I think that he's actually not going to run for that specific reason. I don't think he wants the world to know what he's actually worth. That is certainly one theory out there. You know, uh, there was a New York Times uh, uh, reporter, Tim O'Brien, who wrote a book a few years ago who talked to some sources who suggested Trump was really only worth a couple of hundred million dollars. Trump sued uh, Tim O'Brien, the, uh, uh, the reporter, for defamation, claiming to be called a multi-millionaire rather than a multi-billionaire had somehow defamed his reputation. The lawsuit got tossed out of court uh, and Trump then appealed and in fact the appellate argument was heard only a couple of weeks ago in a Jersey City courtroom Trump showed up and was slipping notes to his lawyers he clearly is very exercised about this issue but will we ultimately see that document that lays out his wealth um, you know we're gonna know very shortly but that's something he's gonna have to do if he goes through with this presidential run yeah I, I don't believe he's gonna do it at all uh, I, I I would be shocked by it. but We'll see. There's Donald can uh, shock us. But you know, you had another great part of this interview about Trump University, which was great. I, I just want to run that for everybody and then come back and sure. ask you about it. Why did you call it a university? Because we didn't know there was any rules or regulations about using the name university. We didn't, didn't check that out? Uh, I think probably they felt that we would have qualified. If we didn't qualify, that's fine. We changed the name. And people would pay money to hear you. Sure. They pay right. money. Why, why? Am I supposed to do it for free? <laughs> well, people, for free? people have to pay, as I understand it, up to $35,000 for the gold seminars. And, and they did. I There's very little problem with Trump University. There's very little. I think we have one or two little lawsuits out of thousands of people that went through it. We have one or two little lawsuits. There's one in California. There's a little lawsuit. <laughs> so he said, just a little lawsuit. He seems to be involved in a lot of little lawsuits. But what was this? Was this a real university that have classes, professors, or it's not in any uh, not any real university in the sense you and I would understand it. It was basically a series of seminars. The first thing they asked you to do, according to some of the uh, uh, students who went through it, is to uh, up the limit on your credit card to thirty-five thousand dollars, so you can then afford the gold seminar, in which you really learn the secrets of Donald Trump's success and learn how to become a millionaire. Uh, stay regulators all over the country have gotten complaints about this there is a class uh, a class action lawsuit being filed by uh, 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 former students in California and as we reported in the piece last night the Texas Attorney General's office had opened up an, a, a investigation into dece possible deceptive trade practices against Trump University and only dropped it after Trump University uh, told the state uh, Attorney General's office they would stop doing business in Texas in effect they dropped out of Texas entirely. All right, Michael, stay with us, actually. I want to bring in MSNBC political analyst Richard Wolf to talk about this, too. Richard, great having you here. Uh, Thanks, Cenk. All right, two of the guys that I've talked to the longest, probably, in my career. All right, so, Richard, um, talk to us about the political implications here. I mean, the main selling point of Trump seems to be, I'm a great businessman. If there's some problems with that, is there big problems in his credibility as a politician? Well, uh, to any reasonable person, if you piece together Mike's interview with Savannah's interview the other day, you have someone who isn't prepared on policy and doesn't have much of a business record, but that's actually not what his main platform is here. His main platform is to be outrageous and to speak to that part of the Republican Party that wants something more and more extreme. In short, they want more change and not less change. And so the more outrageous he is, the more he gets attacked by respectable media organizations and great reporters like Mike Isikoff, the better it is for him him because this isn't about credibility it's who can say the most uh, impressive things that speak to this sense of, of hurt and rage that they have and Republicans have to ask themselves do they want to be as the Democrats were in 2004 do they want to date someone like Dean and marry someone like Kerry or do they want to stick with someone like Dean if they stick with someone like Dean they're gonna have Donald Trump being a front-runner not just a year out of from the nomination but maybe a few months out from 
from the nomination. But, you know, I, I know that the Republican voters sometimes aren't really deeply attached to facts, but here the facts seem to be something that they would be bothered by. For example, when you go to Trump's record, yesterday we did a whole segment on how incredibly liberal uh, positions he had back in 1999, nationalized health care, an enormous tax on the wealthy, etc. Now on the bailouts, apparently he thought that TARP was uh, worth a shot, uh, that Henry Paulson should get an A, and that uh, Ben Bernanke should get a B plus, and he thought the auto bailouts were uh, uh, swell. Government should stand behind them 100%, he said. Uh, Richard, the Tea Party can't be happy about that. Uh, well, they're not, and of course we found in the last few weeks that uh, Trump is willing to say anything because actually the uh, original position he had was the reasonable one. It was President Bush's position. Uh, Paulson was obviously Bush's uh, uh, Treasury Secretary, and, and the policy worked. But that's, of course, not what gets you the nomination now, not what gets you attention. A and really, he has been propelled at this point, apart from the media interest, by going after the birth certificate, by being as outrageous as possible, questioning the authorship of dreams from my father it, you know it doesn't really matter what the policy position is whether he's consistent it does he speak to that rage that's out there that 15 20 percent of the republican party is into it's not the majority of the republican party but in a multi-candidate field that's what puts you as the front runner and and I, michael you know we've yeah. had uh, a lot of polls on this now and trump's doing rather well in most of them the latest one is a mcclatchy one and he's at third at 13 percent which isn't bad he's been at the top of some of the polls w what was your sense i think the question everybody's asking it is this guy for real uh, is well, this all a show to get more attention for the Trump name, or do you think there's a real chance he's going to run here? You know, I, it's funny because after this, as you can see, uh, often contentious interview, um, Trump actually invited me up to his office upstairs, one floor up, and wanted to talk politics and started asking me about people like Ralph Reed, who he's interviewing to be a campaign manager. What did I think of him? Uh, and I pointed out that he had previously worked for Pat Robertson in the Christian Coalition, uh, and he said, yeah, but that would be good in Iowa, you know, that would be good in Iowa. Uh, Tony Fabrizio, a pollster who he's been talking to. So I got to say, even though I know there's a lot of skepticism out of there, out there, and I think for good reason, um, I think he's taking this pretty far. And I think that's one reason you're seeing increasingly uh, increasing nervousness on the part of, you know, Republican professionals like Karl Rove, which is why he came out with that comment that a Trump candidacy would be a joke. He doesn't want the Karl Roves of the Republican Party don't want Donald Trump sucking up all the oxygen. Michael, that's a really interesting insight because it goes to show you after the interview, he still wants to talk to you. He's, he's an yeah. amazing guy and he seems to be pretty serious, as you said. I mean, getting down to Tony Fabrizio means he's getting pretty serious. So, yeah, Richard, he's getting into the weeds. Richard, yeah, final I'm question for you real quick. How thrilled is the White House about this development? Oh, th this is second only to Sarah Palin. By the way, Mike, make sure that he didn't ask you to raise a credit card limit as well when he goes up to his <laughs> office next time. But, you know, the White House would, uh, would love to see this happen. This is not how you win the middle ground in America. Uh, it just polarizes the Republican Party as a whole, as a brand. Karl Rove knows that if he's going to raise the millions he needs for his uh, outside spending groups, he needs more respectable candidates in there, more realistic prospects to win. You know, he tried to do the same uh, when it came down to Christine O'Donnell. Donald, and that didn't work either. Karl Rove is not going to chase this out of the party. It looks to me that, again, given that choice the Democrats faced in 2004, they're going to go for the more extreme, less electable candidate because it speaks to how they're feeling, at least for, the, again, that 15, 20 percent, which could be enough in this race. All right. NBC's national investigative correspondent Michael Isikoff with a great interview there and MSNBC political analyst Richard Wolf. Thank you both. You bet. Thank you.